Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. Today we're exploring the origins of the English, later British, East India Company. During the more than 250 years that this company was operational, it would trade in, among other things, spices, textiles, narcotics and people. The British Crown abolished the company in 1858, in the aftermath of the Indian Rebellion, also known as the First War of Independence, which happened the previous year in 1857. However, the foothold this company had established through its administrative controls, taxation system, military might and property, provided the British government with the necessary elements to enact British colonial rule over India in the form of the British Raj, which held power until the Indian Independence Act of 1947 that also saw the partition of India. But that's how the company ended. How did it begin? Just what led up to its creation? At the very end of December, it will be 421 years since a royal charter was granted to the founder members of the East India Company. As this company was gearing up, the sun was getting ready to set on the Elizabethan age. Nevertheless, the formation of this company has roots that stretch much further back than that. And to understand the origins of the East India Company, which is the purpose of this video, I want to provide some brief, but hopefully not too reductive, context. I'm also planning to link any relevant context providing videos that I've made in the description box of this video. From the late medieval period, a host of nations found themselves engaged in a kind of race that was equal parts technological, spiritual, territorial, fiscal and defensive. As our focus for today is on the English slash British East India Company, let's use England, specifically Elizabethan England, as the example to unpack these motivations. When Elizabeth ascended to the throne in 1558, her nation had weathered the religious upheavals and foreign and domestic threats of her father and half-brother's reformation, and then, after that, her half-sister's counter-reformation. Elizabeth's own faith would undo her sister's work and take the nation away from Rome and the papacy once again. Elizabeth also inherited a nation in great fiscal trouble. Her father had debased the currency to such an extent that it was now distrusted at home and abroad. Traders were requiring greater weights of English coin for their wares to ensure that they weren't being shortchanged. Additionally, Elizabeth was the daughter of the first Queen of England to be executed for treason. Elizabeth had been named a bastard by her father and removed from the line of succession by him for a time. She had made no protective diplomatic marriage with a foreign power and, as would become clear as the reign went on, it didn't look like she was going to make one at all. From her volcanic anomaly in the North Atlantic, Elizabeth aided by her subjects, sought ways to insulate herself and her nation from internal and external threats. One of her first acts was to begin the recoinage of her nation's currency, and by the 1560s, trust was already regrowing in English coin both at home and abroad. Having achieved this, no doubt, Elizabeth would think it an anathema if she had to debase the coinage herself again. So, if her nation needed to produce more coin, that would need to be achieved through bringing in more gold and silver to the realm to make that coin. International adventuring, trading and plantation had proved incredibly profitable for the early adopters like Spain and Portugal. Indeed, evidence of just how quick off the mark these nations had been can be found in the Treaty of Tordesillas from 1494, which agreed to divide the New World between Spain and Portugal. It goes without saying that the indigenous inhabitants of this New World were not consulted. 
if and when England wanted their own colonial look in, they would be turning up pretty late to the party. For many years, the trading hub of Antwerp had been a very useful resource for England to sell its cloth. English wool, for example, was a very well-respected and profitable commodity. England would also be able to source all manner of necessary and luxury imports from Antwerp. So England was, in many ways, heavily reliant on Antwerp. So when financial problems began to impact Antwerp's capacity to support itself as a trade hub, it was necessary for nations like England to seek relationships elsewhere. As with a number of the issues that Elizabeth had to confront during her reign, the decline of Antwerp was something that had commenced from before she was on the throne, beginning in around 1551. Also dated to around this time was the formation of a collective known as the Mystery Company and Fellowship of Merchant Adventurers for the Discovery of Unknown Lands, etc. The plan for them was to skip over Antwerp as a now ill-equipped middleman and instead to find new trade routes and trade relationships for King Edward VI England to enjoy. As a first attempt, this company went in search of a northeast passage, one that would allow them to trade directly with Cathay, as it was known then, and also with the Spice Islands. Finding this route would unfortunately prove fatal for a number of those involved. In fact, the northeast passage would not be completely journeyed through until the later 19th century. Unsurprisingly, this 16th century company's mission would therefore change to one of diplomacy, in the hopes of creating a successful trading relationship with Russia by winning Tsar Ivan IV over. We might know Ivan IV better as Ivan the Terrible. In this, the company achieved their end. So in 1555, Queen Mary I oversaw this company being reincorporated to be known as the Muscovy Company, also known as the Russia Company. At last, England's dependence on Antwerp was not all-consuming. And this company would continue to operate successfully in the next reign of Mary's half-sister Elizabeth and beyond. So, some good news for Elizabeth there then. When she takes up the throne, there is already a trading company that is successfully operating to mitigate the issues of Antwerp being in decline. However, Elizabeth had arguably more stacked up against her than her half-sister Mary had had. So I can see why she and her people might be keen to diversify the old trade route portfolio, so to speak. One of the things that was standing against her, certainly, is the fact that in 1561, Elizabeth's Roman Catholic first cousin once removed had returned to Scotland to rule in person as Mary Queen of Scots. Mary Queen of Scots was forced to abdicate and chose to flee to England in 1568. For the following nearly 20 years, Elizabeth had a rival to her throne, a Roman Catholic rival to her throne, as a disgruntled detainee under house arrest in her own nation. To compound the problem, raise the temperature and the threat level, in 1570, so two years after Mary Queen of Scots had arrived in England, Pope Pius V published the Regnant in Excelsis, a papal bull excommunicating Elizabeth, which, as a result, named her as a false monarch, to whom no loyal Catholic owed allegiance, and whose deposition would therefore be divinely sanctioned. With A Roman Catholic option so close at hand in Mary Queen of Scots, tensions unsurprisingly began to run high, and thoughts turned to defence, how to fund it, and how to enact it. In 1577, Dr John Dees, the general and rare memorials pertaining to the perfect art of navigation, was one of the earliest extant texts to make mention of a British empire as a notion. 
Elizabeth's court astrologer was also a leading advisor for her in maritime matters, and he used this book to press the value of having a strong navy, one that would not only defend Elizabeth's realm, but would also expand its borders and enrich its coffers. In offering this advice, Dr John Dee frequently wins quite a lot of admiration from historians for his powers of foresight, because England and then Britain's prowess as a naval maritime power is frequently offered as a reason for both its military and mercantile prowess in the centuries that followed. From the year before the publication of Dee's book, the search was already on for another different route for England's maritime vessels to take. Between 1576 and 1587, various voyages, beginning with those led by Martin Frobisher, were launched from England in the hope of finding the Northwest Passage. This is in contrast to the previous Northeast Passage that was discussed. With the Northwest Passage, they also hoped to find a shortcut to the promised riches of trade with the Far East. In late 1577, Francis Drake, in his flagship the Pelican, departed from Plymouth. Drake would not return until 1580, by which point he had renamed his ship the Golden Hind in order to honour his patron, Sir Christopher Hatton, whose crest was of a golden hind. Drake had also led his fleet to plunder the ships and ports of Spain in the Americas. Especially profitable was the Golden Hind's raid on a ship called the Nuestra Señora de la Concepción, which was apparently filled to the brim with valuable commodities. Some suggest that this crew also went in search of the Northwest Passage at this time, but if they did, then they were as unsuccessful as the others who tried during this period. Indeed, the Northwest Passage would not be successfully navigated until the start of the 20th century. Drake's crew journeyed on, and they made land in the Moluccas, or Spice Islands, which at the time Portugal was laying claim to. Nevertheless, Drake secured a meeting with the Sultan of Ternate, with whom he made a treaty and from whom he secured a trading cargo of apparently six tonnes of cloves. On September 26th, 1580, the Golden Hind returned to Plymouth, having also circumnavigated the world. It is said that from this voyage's mostly piratical activities, the investor saw a profit of 4000 pounds 600% on their original investment. According to the economist J.M. Keynes, the English foreign debt was paid off from the Queen's share of the proceeds, and there was enough left over, some £42,000 apparently, for her to also capitalise on a new venture. A venture that was able to come into being following a series of diplomatic negotiations between Elizabeth and the then Ottoman Sultan Murad III. These negotiations took the form of a fascinating correspondence and exchange of envoys between these two heads of state. This diplomacy would continue into the next Ottoman reign, where, in addition to communicating with Murad's son and successor, there was also an exchange of letters and spectacular gifts that took place between Elizabeth and Murad's former chief consort, a woman who had taken the incredibly powerful title of Valide Sultan when her son, Mehmed III, succeeded his father in 1595. It is said that this woman, Safiye Sultan, used one of Elizabeth's gifts, a golden coach, which she is thought to have received during her son's reign in around 1599, to gallivant around Istanbul, which caused an enormous scandal. Her return gifts to Elizabeth, according to her letter of thanks for the carriage from 1599, were, quote, a robe, a sash, two large gold embroidered bath towels, three handkerchiefs, and a ruby and pearl tiara. I don't know why, but I really enjoy the thought of these two incredibly powerful women communicating with each other and sharing these gifts back and forth. But for the rest of our story, we have to hop back to the previous Ottoman rule, the rule of Murad III. 
In 1580, he agreed to full trade capitulations for England. The following year, 1581, saw the creation of the Turkey Company, also known as the Levant Company. And it was in this venture that Elizabeth invested her profits from Drake's circumnavigation, or rather, probably from the piracy that he took part in during that circumnavigation. In many ways, Elizabeth is holding her hand dangerously close to the fire here, while seemingly claiming that she hopes to avoid being burned. It's said that Elizabeth talked a lot about the need for discretion. But as far as I'm concerned, Philip II of Spain was well aware of how his losses to Elizabeth's pirates were not only going unpunished, but were seemingly being celebrated and rewarded by his former sister-in-law. Then Elizabeth, as an additional source of annoyance, had both declined to marry Philip when she became queen and also had chosen to remain arrogantly Protestant throughout her reign. In 1586, Elizabeth's throne and life were threatened by the Babington plot, which sought to replace Elizabeth with Mary, Queen of Scots. Now, I've seen this request a lot in the comments, and I am planning to make a video on the Babington plot very soon, so do keep an eye out for that. But within this plot, Elizabeth's rival queen was caught up, some say entrapped, in a treasonous scheme. For this, Mary, Queen of Scots would be executed at Fotheringay Castle on the 8th of February, 1587. When the news broke, the Catholic nations of Portugal and especially Spain were horrified by Mary's death. They were also, perhaps understandably, pretty fed up with having their treasure ships and ports being continuously raided and robbed by English ships. The Anglo Spanish War had officially begun in 1585. But I would argue that the most famous fracas came in 1588, with the launching of the Spanish Armada in an ultimately failed attempt to invade England and overthrow Elizabeth. However, England and Spain would officially remain at war until 1604, at which point King James I and his government made peace with his predecessor's greatest enemy. But in the meantime, there would be various acts of aggression. Elizabeth's privateers, as no doubt she termed them, that's simply a polite word for pirate, continued to show that great profits could be found by capturing and despoiling the treasure ships of Spain and Portugal. Certainly, Elizabeth's coffers were filled with the returns on her investment in these privateers' voyages. In 1592, a Portuguese ship, the Madre de Deus, was seized. In the ship's hold, were inordinate riches. There were precious gems and metals, fine fabrics and costly spices. But arguably, as if not more valuable, was the fact that something else that was seized was this ship's mariner's handbook. A how-to guide, if you will, for engaging in the profitable trade with China, India and Japan. As well as going after enemy ships, these privateers continued to take any opportunity to plunder the ports of Spain, whether they were mainland ones or those overseas. Probably the most famous is a mainland port being attacked, this being the sack of Cadiz, which took place in 1596. Apparently, this was motivated by a fear that another armada might be coming England's way, that a new Spanish fleet was being gathered at one of Spain's most important ports, Cadiz. However, the port also held a merchant fleet that has been estimated to have been worth as much as 12 million ducats. And the spoils from that would have enriched both the privateers and their patrons, of which the Queen was one. As it was, the attackers focused their attention on bringing Cadiz to its knees first. And this allowed the Spanish to burn the merchant fleet rather than let it fall into enemy hands. So the privateers would have to make do with the ransom they secured to ensure the safety of the inhabitants of Cadiz, which was worth 
120,000 ducats, so quite a lot less than that merchant fleet. But they could also take whatever else of value they were able to seize while they were sacking the city. By the second half of the 1590s, it seems evident that increasingly those of an adventurous and mercantile disposition were having their eyes trained on securing both a trade route to and a trading relationship with those eastern lands that produced and sold the most coveted of luxuries. That's not to say that the goal of planting or colonising in America was being completely overlooked, but I'd imagine that when news of those missing Roanoke colonists was brought to England by the former governor, John White, that news may have given other hopefuls pause. As it was, any who did want to travel in this direction would have to wait for the founding of Jamestown in the next reign to have their hopes realised. I'd argue for many that they would have thought that for the time being, focusing their attentions elsewhere probably would have felt like a safer proposition. Safer, but not without risk completely. Indeed, in 1596, the same year that Cadiz was sacked, a voyage made up of three ships sailed for the east. All three were lost. The life of an overseas explorer was one of risk, to life, limb and wealth, but the rewards could be life-changing. Take Francis Drake, born into a farming family in Devon in 1540, who, through his efforts at sea and the risks he took, managed to enrich himself beyond belief. A man who found himself knighted by Queen Elizabeth I in 1581. On December 31st, 1600, Queen Elizabeth granted a royal charter for the governor and company of the merchants of London trading into the East Indies to George Clifford, Earl of Cumberland, and 215 knights, aldermen, and burgesses. According to the charter, for the next 15 years, this company had the monopoly on English trade to the Indies, an area that was defined as extending from the Cape of Good Hope to the Magellan Straits. On the 13th of February 1601, the first voyage of the East India Company left Woolwich. The weather was, however, against them, which meant that they had to wait and leave Tor Bay on the 20th of April. Four ships departed, commanded by the soldier and merchant James Lancaster. As a side note, the expedition did not reach Table Bay until the 9th of September, by which point 105 men had died from scurvy across the four ships. However, less men had died on the flagship that James Lancaster was captaining, as he had provided his crew with lemon juice. The company reached Achin in Sumatra on the 5th of June 1602 and went to meet with the king there. Lancaster, perhaps aided by a letter from his queen, made a favourable impression. So much so, he was able to obtain permission to trade without paying any customs duties. Also, as was probably to be expected by now, when word of a richly filled Portuguese vessel reached Lancaster, he chose to join up with the Dutch to reap the spoils of plundering it. After this, Lancaster then travelled to Bantam in Indonesia. And by the time he departed from there on the 20th of February 1603, he had secured a factory or trading post there. He'd agreed the terms for trade and been given a letter and a present to give to Queen Elizabeth. This expedition, led by Lancaster, also returned to England with an impressive stock of spices. They had pepper cloves and nutmegs. James Lancaster was back in England on September the 11th, 1603. The letter and gift he was carrying were for a now deceased queen. So instead, he was received by her successor, King James. James knighted Lancaster for his achievements. Five years later, in 1608, an East India Company ship the Hector, which was being commanded by William Hawkins, would be the first company vessel to arrive in India when it docked at Surat in Gujarat. Then, 
Four years after that, in 1612, following the defeat of the Portuguese fleet that was attempting to enforce their pre-existing trading agreements with the Mughal authorities, the English East India Company was able to set up their own factory or trading post at Surat. This would be their second Indian trading post, as they'd already secured one on the other side of India at Masulipatnam during the previous year of 1611. In 1613, the clove sailed into the port of Hirado, and thus began the East India Company's trade with Japan. The company would successfully establish a trading post at Hirado. However, a decade later, in 1623, this factory would have to close, due to a failure in establishing good enough trading relationships with the shogun, and because of conflict with Dutch traders. Even with the short existence and eventual closure of the factory in Japan, the stage was certainly set for an almost unfathomable expansion for this company. From these foundations grew the structure that would eventually, for a time at least, support and indeed enable the spread of the British Empire. It's often stated that the sun never set on the empire presided over by Queen Victoria, and this is usually used to present Victorian Britain and its empire as a military and mercantile superpower. It's something that is used to prove the power and prowess of the nation ruled by Victoria. However, that empire's expansion was arguably made possible, certainly easier, because of the exploratory diplomacy that had been inspired not by a drive for power and prowess, but because of the threats and insecurities that were faced by another queen, one who ruled centuries before. But what do you think? Does the context from the period leading up to the formation of the East India Company alter your perception of it? Or does it fit with your view of it? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video, or you can find me on social media. I'll leave links to the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Follow me over on some or all of them so we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, why not share it with your friends? Please also let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel. And if you hit the bell icon beside the subscribe button and then select all from the drop down, YouTube has promised to tell you when I've next uploaded. I hope you can have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye for now. Thank you.